All right. So this meeting of the Historic District Commission will take place in a webinar format through Zoom. Chair of the commission is Sarah Moriarty. Host of the webinar is building official. Staff attending this meeting include Peters of English and Linda Galetta. Anyone speaking should state their names prior to speaking each time. The panelists in this webinar meeting will be the commission members and the building staff. Panelists who would like to comment on an item should indicate such by using the icon to raise hand on the bottom of the screen. After a panelist raises their hand, they'll be able to comment one at a time when called upon by the chairperson. Panelists should mute their microphones until called upon. Panelists calling into the meeting by telephone may raise or lower their hand by pressing star nine. To mute or unmute your call, press star six. To make a motion or second a motion, commission members can raise a hand and be acknowledged by the host or chair. To vote on a motion, commission members will be called upon individually by the chair to vote. The, pu the public can participate in the meeting during the public communications agenda item. The public will be asked to raise their hand during public communications if they want to speak at this time by using the icon to raise hand at the bottom of the screen. The public will be called upon by the host one at a time and will be able to speak during this time. Attendees must identify them uh, themselves before speaking. Thank you. So I will call this meeting to order on March 15th, 2022 at 7.04. Um, and Todd, if you would like to read the call. Okay. Dear Matt, please publish the following public notice for one insertion on Monday, March 7, 2022. Town of Groton notice of public hearing Historic District Commission. The Historic District Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, March 15, 2022 at 7 p.m. virtually via the Zoom platform to hear the following applications requesting a certificate of appropriateness. HCC 22-08, 38 West Mystic Avenue, Diane Scalaris, owner, Vanessa Jabagjorian, applicant, roof-mounted solar panels and energy storage system, pin number 26198052811116. HCC 22-09, 240 Noank Road, Scott and Jessica Ganchow, owners, Michael Asif, applicant, Dormer Edition, pin number 26180628831. HDC 22-1017 Gravel Street, Jennifer Grace, owner. Christopher Renat, applicant, demolition of house and garage and construction of house, detached garage, ADU and fences, pin number 26191844115771. The Zoom, a Zoom meeting link will be posted to the town's website meetings calendar or can be attended by visiting www.zoom.us. Webinar ID 827-528-60804, password 3463030, or by phone 1-312-626-6799. Access to electronic equipment at the town hall annex for the purposes of attending, participating in the meeting should be provided to any member of the public who provides a written request to the Office of Planning and Development not less than 24 hours prior to the meeting. Applications are on file and available for public inspection during normal business hours at the planning department, 134 Groton Long Point Road, Groton, Connecticut. Dated this seventh day of March, 2022 at Groton, Connecticut, Todd Grady, secretary. Thank you, Todd. So I will call the first public hearing, HDC 22-08, 38 Westminster Gav, Diana Scalaris, owner of Vanessa, Vanessa applicant. Um, oh. <laughs> are they here hi sarah yes i'm here excellent all right well you may begin your presentation please okay thank you um i think i need approval for sharing screen oh are you, also, you, you, presenting? Have to, you have to introduce yourself so we know how to pronounce your last name oh yeah sorry i know my last name is kind of uh, a mouthful it's jabajorian um, okay, and um, representing Tesla Energy, this is my first um, historic district commission meeting. Um, so be gentle on me. <laughs> of course. So you can share your screen now, or you should be able to. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So are you able to see my screen at all? Yes. 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 Um, let me see if I can just move my. Are you able to see um, the drawings now? No, no. I, I moved it out of the way, didn't I? OK, I just want to make sure. Now we can see them. OK, so um, if you want to guide me and, and you know, tell me where I should start, um, I have the plans open and all the supporting documents uh, um, uploaded as well. Why don't you start with where the property is located? Um, property um, is 38 West, West Mystic Ave, town of Groton. Um, the project um, relates to installing 
16 uh, roof mounted solar panels with a system size of 6.4 kilowatts. Um, in addition, one energy storage system in which that energy is stored. Um, and um, Tom, I don't, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but he did uh, mention that what he was interested in was pages one through four, page six and page 13. Um, so I can walk through those with you. Um, okay, so let's go through. Um, this is a site plan here showing the mounting plane of which the solar panels will be located. And here is the other panel mounting plane of where that will be located. Um, ESS on the legend represents energy storage and that is located usually in the basement or the garage, in this case, it's the basement. Um, and if we go to the next page, we have a kind of an example of what it would look like um, from the street view. Um, it's a little blurry. I don't know why it was blurry, but um, it kind of gives you a rough idea if you were to stand out in the front and how that would look. And if we go to the next page, this is kind of a breakdown of how you know it's put together. It's a side view of the mounting plane and the PV module on top. And then kind of more of the specifics on that and equipment. Um, and then I'll walk through page six. Once again, this is the three line diagram. I'll just briefly touch upon this. It shows where the AC disconnect will be, the AC, um, the main service panel. This is the energy storage system, just to kind of like show how that is all you know, set up um, and how it will be um, on the house. Page six is the placard. Just to show for safety and, safety and equipment, um, it gives you a location of where those, um, the meter and the main panel will be located. And you know, if anything, you needed to rapid shut down your system at all for whatever reason. Um, and that will be also placed on the house when um, inspection comes time, if we do move forward that with this project. Um, and then just to go to the last page, um, page 13, this kind of goes into depth of our Tesla photovolactic module. Um, it lays out, you know, very, all the specifications in which this module um, entails. Um, and I also have a supporting engineer letter. So if you guys want to jump in at all or have questions, let me know. I just want you to know that it's uh, very rare that we don't approve solar systems. Okay. Even though it's in a historic district because that's what we've been doing and because the state supports it. Okay. Sarah could probably say it more elegant, eloquently. Just fine. <laughs> um, Vanessa, would you mind going back to the photo of the house for me? Sure. Okay, so those are your 16 panels photoshopped on the house, right? Correct. Okay. It's pretty far back from the street, so you're not going to see it too much. So do you That's also taken in the winter time. So even imagine with leaves on the trees. Um, and there's, you know, ways that people do end up kind of making it more of a subtle or hidden um, view. Okay. I, I just wanted to see this photo again. I don't know if any other commission member has any uh, additional questions or comments for the applicant. Do you have a picture of where that uh, tag and the service is going to be on the house? Sure, I do. Actually, I had that um, the the photo gallery in which the surveyors um, upload photos. I can pull that up really quick. Uh, actually, can you see it from the public way? Can you see it from the street? Um, if you have good vision, it's um. <laughs> It's like, it's like kind of, it is on the front of the house, um, but I don't, 
honestly, I don't know if someone knew what to look for, they could, they might see it, but um, it, it's not noticeable. So let me just um, pull one of these photos to show. Okay, I'm just gonna move this tab over here. Um, so this is where the meter is. And uh, here's some pictures. So that's the front of the house. That's the, the main door there. And then it looks like there's a basement entrance as well. And that's where the main service panel is. Okay, thank you. No problem. It's kind of interesting to see it on the front of the house. I'm usually used to seeing it on the, the, like the side or the back of the house. We have a lot of houses that have it on the front. Oh, okay. Any other questions for the applicant? No. Mm -hmm. oh, that picture is taken from Irving Street, not West Mystic Avenue, correct? Yeah, yeah, I believe so. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, even if I did bring up the address like on Google Maps, it's probably better visual if I saw it that way, like a street view. And I can bring that up as well. Let's see, I can go here. This is West, yeah, this is West Mystic Avenue. And I believe this is the property. If I go around the corner, yeah, that might be where the front of the house is. Yeah, see, that's the front. And that's on, um, on Irving. Yes, that, that's the street there. So you are correct. Um, and, and so it's interesting because this could also appear to be the front of the house, um, but they are portraying the panels that way, because <laughs> that's where the slant is on the roof. Well, the address is West Main, so it's actually technically the side of the house. <laughs> yeah. So that's that. Any other questions for the applicant? Mm. No? Does the applicant have anything that they want to add? Um, well, um, I have nothing but good things to say, and I, I guess I, I'm trying not to be biased, but um, sustainability is, is key with the um, solar power and electric power, and especially in today's time. So um, it would be great to have that included here in the town of Groton and and even in the historic district area too. Um, it's nice to know that the state does support that. Okay. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. So, does anyone in the audience want to speak for this application? Yes, I do. All right, Mr. Keatsman. My name's Ted Keatsman. I live at 25 West Mystic Avenue, just up the street from this house. And I think it'd be wonderful if this application was approved for the reasons she's articulated. Right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in the audience? Would anyone in the audience like to speak against this application? All right. HDC 22-08 is closed. Vanessa, just because you're new to this process, what we do is we go through the rest of our public hearings and then we close our public hearings and then we vote on the applications. Okay. okay. You, do not, you do not have to stay, stay. but you don't have to. Yeah. So after my um, review, I can log off after your your um, approval. Well, you can log off now if you want. You just won't know okay. if you were approved or not, and you get a letter. Otherwise, you can stay on and, and hear the vote and then log off. Oh, I see. Okay, and we will get that letter sent to us. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, and I hope you guys have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right, HDC 22-09, 240 Noank Road, Scott and Jessica Ganchow, owners, Michael Asif, applicant. Lee McMahon? Hello, yes. Um, 
my my name's Lee McMahon, and I'm here to help with Michael Asif. Michael Asif is the contractor for the this property. Okay. Um, for oh, sorry, what? No, oh. go ahead. Sorry. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of Scott and Jessica Kanchow and Michael Asif, which Mike Michael might show up. I'm not sure, but I am the architectural designer working on it. Um, the project, it's adding a dormer to the house, so I can just share my screen and I can walk you through our drawings. I'm going to click the wrong button. Actually, that button worked. It made sense. Um, so this is the property, 240 Noank Road in Mystic, Connecticut, 06355. Um, we're going to be adding a dormer on the north side of the house. Does the project name say Scott Dormer? Um, it, do you mean the one was filed with your department? Yeah, yeah. Um, Michael did that, so I'm not quite sure. Oh, what okay, okay. okay. I just that, that sounds about right. <clears throat> okay. So um, we have three sheets. One is the existing conditions and existing drawings. We have a site plan in the top left and just calling out where that addition is going. We're not expanding the footprint of the house. Um, that's an existing floor plan showing there's three bedrooms. We're not adding any new bedrooms. They're gonna add like a, a playroom and a family room. These are the existing drawings showing roughly the, what the materials are. And then we have some photos. So um, from Noank Street, you can see that's the location where the dormer will be going, right where that blue arrow is landing. A little left side there. Again, pointing it out. This is the back, si the opposite side of the property, so not from Noank Street. This is just to show the materials. Um, the, the building has hardy plank um, five inch exposure and the color will match it. And I have notes on that additional pages. The scaling is not relevant for the dormer. Showing the conditions of the trim and the drip caps. Uh, so page two has the proposed floor plan for the dormer and where it's being added. Um, this is these are structural drawings showing how we're going to carry the load down. There's a structural engineer who's included on the project um, who's going to be providing proper calculations because I'm not a licensed professional. So I just do my concept and put on the drawings and then he will specify pieces. This is the first floor. This is the uh, roof framing plan. This is showing the first floor where the load will be being carried through and the foundation plan where that will go through as well. And then the final page are the proposed elevations. Starting from the Noank side, it shows and points out where the, that new dormer is going to be. Um, it has notes about the materials. And down here, there's a general note to match existing. And I label what all those materials are. Um, and this is the back side of the house. So the dormer is on the right side there. This is a building section showing roughly how the that structure is going to function. And then this is from the, the side that the dormer, the north side that I was showing the dormer's elevation. And uh, um, should I go into detail about these materials here? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's to match existing. So the existing house has uh, charcoal gray, type colored asphalt shingles. We'll use the company GAF, their architectural shingles style. Um, the eaves will match existing, so about one by six. Um, this does not need a gutter because there's roof below it that'll be catching the water for the new gutter or for the water that sheds off of that roof. It's not adding any new roof surface. Um, the trim will match existing, hardy board will match. Um, five inch reveal, like I said, or uh, exposure. And that's it. Have you got a new window? 
They're adding three new double double hung windows. These three. And what kind are they? Um, I specified Marvin Elevate line. Um, oh, I see it. Yep, you've got it right there. Yeah. You may have gone through it and I just didn't see it. Was there a GIS map showing where the house was? Um, the only, I, I have this very generic site plan that shows the property line and where the house is located in that property. Okay. I had shown a, uh, the Google map to you, but nothing beyond that. Yeah, the Google map is in the file. The, no, the town of Groton map is on the stuff Linda sent us. Oh, let me just scroll there. Oh, I see it. I think that I think that, that Michael got caught up in his children's um it's right under the application. Yep, I found it. Thank you. No, I can't think what they're called after school and the teachers give reviews. I can't think what it's called. Parent teacher conference. Thank you. Yes. I have one today. You have them too. Um, so the GIS is in the submitted file. It just wasn't shown. So that was my only question. Does anyone have any other questions for the applicant? No. That little buttonwood is a dirt road. Right. Oh, no, you're one away from that. I see. No questions? No. Comments? Okay. Um, would anyone in the audience like to speak for, I'm sorry, would the applicant like to say anything else? Um, I'm oh, only if there's any more information that you need from me. This is kind of new to me as well, doing this kind of um, presentation. So I'm not quite sure what else to explain. So only unless somebody asks. Um, I, I mean, your application has everything in it that, that we need. So I'm fine. I don't think any other commission member has any questions. So, uh, uh, this is just to throw it out, but since the final the case seems like it'll be a lot longer, what would we think of just ruling on this before we start the other one? Um, we can do that. I, I don't have any objection to that. Um, what are we doing? So let me, let me close this public hearing and then yeah. I'll, I'll mention it. So would anyone in the audience like to speak for this application? Would anyone in the audience like to speak against this application? HGC 22-09 is closed. So Don just suggested we close public hearings, we vote on the first two applications, and then we reopen public hearings to hear the last application, only in the event that the last application may be lengthy. That's fine. Anyone have any objection to that? Well, it, uh, we've never done that that I've been on. Um, is there is is that procedure OK? We've closed and reopened public hearings before. Never, never for the expediency of allowing people to get off the call, which is what Don was trying to do. I, I think so. we, we did it once when you weren't on the board, Bonnie. Huh. I okay. recall. No, we don't. Uh, I have it. no problem. I just don't want whatever we voted on thrown out because we didn't follow procedure. I would just have to put on the record, just you know, make sure you put on the record okay. the reason that you're closing and reopening is because you're trying well, to just in light of that, there's people, there's people for um preliminaries too. So I don't know. Well, that's gonna have to we'll have okay. to make yes. that one's gonna have to wait. Okay. Um okay, so I am going to close public hearings so that we can vote on the first two applications so that those applicants don't have to stay on the call as we go through the next application. Um, so consideration of the two public hearings that we heard on, um, HTC 22-08, 38 I'm, West Pacific Ave. Sorry. I'll make a motion to approve it. Um, I'll second. I'll second. Any, any comments? All right, all in favor, I'll go through the roll call. Null. Aye. 
Moriarty, aye. Levinson, aye. Goodman, aye. Brady. Brady. You're, you're muted, Todd. Hey, wake up, Todd. <laughs> aye, aye. <laughs> HDC 22-08 is approved. Uh, deliberations on HDC 22-09, 240 Noank Road, Scott and Jessica Ganchow. Any comments or motions? I'll make a motion to approve it. I'll second. Any comments? All right, all in favor, Nault? Aye. Moriarty, aye. Levinson? Aye. Goodman? Aye. Brady? Aye. HDC 22-09 is approved. All right, I will reopen public hearings and I will call HDC 22-1017 Gravel Street, Jennifer Grace, owner, Christopher Renat, applicant. Uh, I'm Bill Birchie. Uh, I'll, I, I don't know if Chris is having trouble joining the meeting. Um, you can check on that, make him a panelist. And also maybe- He's on mute right now. Is Chris on mute? Am I on mute? I'm here. No. Can you hear me? There he is now. Yeah. Chris is there. And Dan Grace also, if I make him a participant, the owner. Is, he, is Dan there? I asked him not to mute. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm here. Just okay, so me. can I do screen share? I'll try screen share. Ah, okay. Um, the, you know, I, I think is everybody on the board, I think we is, was here at the preliminary, uh, yeah. going through all in detail. Uh, what I could do tonight is just go through fundamentally, we made some changes based on the comment uh, from the last preliminary, and I, and I might just more focus on those. Uh, that, and then if, if someone has a question, I could focus more on that rather than to go into detail of every slide. Uh, would that be acceptable? I mean, the slides themselves, this is the, you have the paperwork, you know, are, are so they up? My only, I don't think Don was here last meeting. So I would leave that up to Don as to how familiar he is and if he wants you to start from the beginning or not. Uh, Don, were you I, at the first preliminary? Yeah, I was here for the pr first preliminary. Yeah. Yeah. So he's. Maybe you could just go through quickly. Right. Yeah. Okay. No, I, no, I appreciate that. Okay. Um, actually, the only thing I added here was the picture of what it was like in February 22 here on Pearl Street. And actually, we have another picture. Gravel Street looked just like that uh, against the house. So the water level would have been pretty much the tires covering the tires of these cars here on Gravel Street. Uh, that was just a coastal storm. Uh, now, the Requirements for the application, since we're applying to demolish the house and the garage, uh, were to provide description of why we're demolishing something, what that involves, what it will be like after that. And this document uh, addresses that. So it's, it's the purpose of, uh, we're saying demolish the house and the garage and to reconstruct the house to match existing, which in this document would go through what those words mean for us on a raised foundation with additions and attached garage to meet FEMA and Connecticut building and town regulations. Um, so the purpose of this is, is to fulfill that requirement uh, of, of the application. Uh, the sites in a, oh, does it, in the elevation 11 foot flood zone, uh, we have an A2 survey that says the house is actually, first floor is nine feet. Um, and we know that if we do more than substantial improvement on the house, we have to bring the house 100% in compliance with FEMA. Uh, and I added this substantial improvement occurs when the cost of the work exceeds 50% of the value of the existing building. Uh, and you pull out the property card and it says the building's worth $344,200. So 50% of that is $172,000. So if we do more work than that, then it must be brought into compliance with FEMA, the first and town of Groton also, the first floor would have to be at elevation 12, three feet higher than it is today. And the plan renovation, the additions, existing, existing building, 
is be well over $800,000. So in Groton, uh, the substantial improvement resets every year. So basically it would take five years and, and likely more to renovate the house without hitting the substantial improvement. Uh, so practically that's, uh, that's not practical given the extent of renovations uh, that the owner would like to do the house. Um, I have a question for staff. When they're saying it has to be, it's a, a half of the value of the existing building, do they want the assessed value by the town or the actual market value? Because if it was the market value of the property, it's a lot more than three hundred. Yeah, I, I can answer like that. A lot more. I can answer that. It's the building. We we've been through this many 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 times, and and FEMA has a big long document. It's the cost, the appraised value of the building itself. And that's why I circled this on the appraisal card. Oh. And and, and surprisingly enough, oh. we can hire an appraiser and for just the building for you know is he would come up with a very similar number. I mean, it might be a little higher, but I think it would very be similar in our experience. And I mean, I'm just curious on one other thing too. You say that the plans, renovations, and additions are going to be eight hundred thousand. Do you have a number though? Because there was supposed to be a number put on the application. I just curious. Not not for this, Dan. You you don't know what the cost is going to be. Oh, you know we we have that for just the house. We we have that, but it's not required for HDC. That's required it for it for, it asks for a value of the project on the application. Um, I, I can I can find that later. I'd have to walk away from the desk. Uh, you know, where we last evaluated for the owner. I would just be curious based upon your analysis. I, I think it's like 1.2 million, what we're thinking of, you know, of our of our current estimate for the house. Just the house. We need yeah. that. So the house plus the pool plus the breezeway plus the garage plus the the back. What's that? I don't think that's relevant to like the pool and such isn't relevant to us. Well, it says a value of the project on the application, so I'm just curious what the value of the project is. But I don't think that the pool is in our jurisdiction. But skip the pool then. I and mean, what's the value of the project minus the um, pool? I have to walk away to get the notebook. <laughs> well, actually, I mean, let me turn another computer on here. I, I'm just sorry. Puts the computation. I'm just curious what the what the value. No, no is. I understand. But I'm looking at the application I don't think now. The application it's not on that. there. No, it doesn't say that. We don't need to know that. It it used to say that. It doesn't. I filled out a lot of them. It doesn't now, unless I'm missing it. Like project name, address. Location, parcel identification, project description, applicant email, contact info. It's not on here. They don't require it. We don't need it. But I understand your point, but it's not on the application and they don't they don't have to disclose it. It used to be because I filled out a lot of them. <laughs> I remember seeing it, but it's it's not there now. Uh, wow. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh okay, so we're Keep should I go going. ahead? Keep is going. Chris, uh, is Chris Bernard with your party? Is Chris what? Because he's raising he's his here. hand. Chris, he's, he's raising yeah. his hand. So I just I wanted to make sure I had access. I, I, it wasn't letting me in as an attendee or or a panelist rather. You're you're applicant, not a panelist. Okay, I, I can hear him. I can I'm hear him now. Getting the prompt now to join us. So we're good? We are good, thank you. Um, so should I proceed? Yes, please. Okay. We don't need uh, value. Okay, so this this really is basically out of the FEMA document. And if we're re rehabilitating or remodeling, we get a substantial improvement, the building is required to comply. And then basically that says we've got to raise the whole building. Uh, or if it were damaged, substantially if we have the uh, major hurricane it's hurt and we have to rebuild it to be substantial damage we'd have to rebuild it to comply so we can wait for it to be destroyed and then rebuild it to comply or we could build it to comply now basically and and what we're showing this is basically saying 
our base flood elevation here is above the floor, floor elevation. Like the floor here might is like nine, the flood elevation's 11. To meet FEMA, basically you had to move the floor above the base flood elevation. Uh, and then these are out of the Groton uh, zoning regulations. They, they want you actually to elevate it one foot above the base flood elevation. So base flood elevation for the map was 11. So we have to build the first floor uh, elevation 12. Um, and then we were just talking reconstruction to match existing. Uh, what that meant, we presented this uh, uh, a project we did uh, several years ago in the borough where we, uh, this where is the existing house is the, is the top house, well, the previous house. And as we gutted it inside, this was, this was started to be built in the 1820s. Or, uh, and as it, it turns out, this building is, even the main building, is made up of four different buildings inside framing wise. And it was, it was like, sort of impossible to get it strong enough for the wind. So we basically demolished the entire house because we had measured all the trim and details and angles and windows, uh, salvaged the door, you know, these window pieces and re re rebuilt them to match existing. So this, this is an entirely rebuilt house uh, you know, on, on the stone foundation. So that's what we mean in terms of matching existing. It's the matching these trim sizes uh, the details, uh, the architectural details, you know, how the trim worked. Uh, but we did make some changes. These windows are more like the original windows. These were short final windows. We could tell from the inside framing that they were supposed to be bigger uh, originally. Um, you know, so when we say match existing in our application, we're saying we're gonna we're sort of match all of the trim and the details of the existing house. Uh, and then we get into wood frame construction manual, uh, and I'll just quickly go through that. Uh, when we rebuild it, we have to build it to resist all the winds and frames. Very intricate framing, framing details required to resist all the structure. So uh, basically in demolishing the house and rebuilding it, all of the two by four framing, the roof drafters, the floor framing, uh, can be built to make the shear planes that we need and, and the nailing we need uh, and all the hold down bolts we need. Um, and you get into these big tie downs and I can see them here with these big steel rods, believe it or not, that's all in these coastal houses that you see for new construction. So, and we, were, we are required to do all that. So this document was basically uh, for, you know, why we demolish it and what we gain by doing that. Now I'd like to go to the other at risk. Oh, wait, wait, wait. can I do this? Uh, did the picture change here to a floor plan? Yes. The floor plan, yes. All right, good. All right, so this is the application uh, oh. for the house. And we made, after the last meeting, we made some uh, fun, some, some substantive changes, you know, your concerns. Uh, one of the ones we had, there was a concern about a density on the site. And we went through it and we removed the connector uh, between the house and the garage. Um, you know, and you'll see that that's, that's brought the density of the site development, you know, just like equal to the properties next door. Uh, we eliminated 75 feet of driveway uh, that extended to Pearl Street uh, in a, to kind of address some of the ish, worries about drainage and what have you. Um, we had a, a proposed a uh, kind of an obscure uh, railing across the front of the house because we had a raised patio. And, and it really, you couldn't see the house as much. You couldn't perceive it that it was the same house uh, raised up five feet. So we removed that railing and we also lowered that patio six inches. So the front of the house, uh, you know, is more compatibly looking, you know, like this. Uh, and then uh, the building uh, official asked, uh, reminded us any outside AC compressors. Uh, we needed a little compressor for the uh, accessory dulling unit. We added that. I'll show you where we did it. It's got to be above flood elevation and we added one for the garage. 
but the main house would be uh, uh, groundwater heat pumps. There's no outside equipment at all. As a matter of fact, we had to add, that was why we had added that in the back of this, this, this addition. So I'll point that out as we go through the application, those changes. And then uh, we'd been requested for a picture of the stone veneer we were proposing on an actual house. And so we changed that detail. Uh, here are the pictures of the existing house. Uh, this is a little better, more of the side view, I think, than the previous picture we showed uh, to the south. And this north, we got a big tree hiding it, but you can see the north elevation is pretty much, you know, the side of the building. Uh, in the back, uh, there was a, you know, sort of a covered porch extending off the back here. I think it was since removed last year, but, but that's basically, you know, as part of the existing house. Uh, where it is, here's our GSI map, GSI, GIS, <laughs> something wrong with that, I know. Uh, here's the existing house in here where it says 17, and there's an existing garage. And the idea is we demolish this house and rebuild uh, almost exactly on that footprint, uh, the house. And then instead of this garage violates the side yard, we build a compliant garage in about the same place. And then we add an accessory dwelling unit here. Uh, we do have the A2 survey, shows where the house is, and here's where that garage is. Uh, it almost overlaps the property line. Uh, so we'll demolish this and demolish the house. The dark line of the house is the interior of the house. This line here was that outside porch you saw in the back. And this was a patio, you know, not noted off the house. Uh, so in the site plan, the proposed site plan, uh, you can see there was a connector here that we've removed that. Um, we didn't change anything in the house, but you can see the actual, uh, this part of the house doesn't, you know, doesn't come back beyond where that porch was. This is the porch you saw in that photograph. It's been removed. So we're inside that footprint. Uh, we, we do extend back here a little bit here. Um, you can actually see from this, we're concerned about density, you know, the density of this lot's pretty much the density of like an equivalent space uh, to the south here. If you put these two pieces together as garage, and both of these are garages, uh, you'd have house, house, garage, garage, uh, house here, house here. So, you know, in terms of overall density, this pretty much reflects the density that, that we're seeing in this, this region. Uh, between Pearl Street and, and Gravel Street. Uh, so if we look at the, we redid the rendering here, uh, removed that, that railing, it's just showing some, some shrubs that grow on this upper planter. Uh, but that railing, if you can see these high ballards here, uh, that there was a, a railing that went across there. So it was kind of hard to see how the house was. And then this this patio has been dropped six inches. So, you know, we're getting pretty much more of a, equivalent look between these two. And if you remember the photo of the side of the house, that's pretty much what we're seeing here uh, for that. Uh, oh, oops, we, oh look, we're done. Uh, uh, so you know, this is, we're trying to get pretty much from this standing the same place, um, the existing house versus what we're proposing. And again, we've sort of removed that railing here that, that was kind of obscuring everything. So we think it gives a better idea what comparison the two. Uh, and you get an idea from the north side. Remember the, you know, this is just basically the gable end of the house, the bays. Um, we, the bays are actually smaller. I'm, I'm gonna back up here just a little bit. Um, these are the original bays. You can see these red lines coming out here. Those original bays, so we push the bays back, you know, so that they're not extending out as far. Um, so these have been pushed back. And then we, 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 what we found was like bringing, we tried to bring this roof out. We had a whole porch across the front, but we found pushing this back just enough over the bays helped. We also found that showing this uh, gutter line really helped help the view. We we had this porch roof was was sloped up, and you kind of lost the whole identity of the main house. This, so that this was important in in reading the original house, and we kept the middle gable here. 
this porch is pretty much identical. What's there, these columns are identical, the railing's identical. Uh, for this addition back here, the old addition had pretty much a flat roof, kind of like this. So basically we've created about two feet of a steeper roof pitch here. Uh, and then with just a dormer out the side to get the second floor area uh, you know, that we needed. The, okay. Uh, from the back, basically because the garage is here, you won't see much from Pearl Street, but uh, this is just the back of that, that addition. Uh, and there is a porch that we added, you know, where that patio was. Um, there are, by the way, uh, three uh, fences. There, there's a privacy fence we'll talk about uh, that goes pretty much uh, from where the house is here all the way over to Pearl Street, five foot wood lattice, wood, wood, solid wood fence. And then in here, there's a four foot uh, security fence for the pool. This one, this one, this one. And we'll see pictures of those. Uh, those are uh, steel fences picket fences for the pool, and this is a wood wood fence. And, and we'll show you examples of those. Um, so this summarizes in the elevations uh, what we're doing, that the top of the existing floor is this dark black line. That's how low, that's where the house is now. We needed to raise it up to this red line, which is a foot above base flood elevation up to 12, uh, the red line. Uh, some of the floor wood can be below the flood. It's just the top, sort of the hardwood floor has to be above flood elevation, if you will. Uh, so what are the fundamental changes? We've added the steeper roof here on the back, uh, back addition. Uh, in the two places, we reduced the size of the bays, the two bays. Uh, we're saving the pilasters for the front door, but we're adding uh, uh, side lights here. We're retaining the... Uh, pitch in the middle here. And we only thing we've really fundamentally added to the geometry were these two little two dormers on either side to provide some views of the river. Uh, this is the garage facing east, but the house is in front of this. Um, this is the garage from the south. Uh, the south neighbor would see that. Um, this is the north side of the house, uh, the north neighbor, you know, we see that, you can see this railing, you know, it's been removed here, um, north of the garage. This little structure here, we have a generator and the side yard has to be up at 12 feet also. And this is where we put the uh, little AC compressor for the garage, because it's gotta be up here at 12 feet also. Uh, so again, this is the platform next to the garage. Uh, I can go back to, an, in 3D, this is where it is, that little platform, that's generator and the AC compressor for the garage. Um, pretty much in the middle of the site. Uh, now in terms of matching existing, uh, the intent is that um, these, these, this uh, fascia e edge here, there, there are wooden gutters here. And what we plan to do is rebuild it with the original wood gutters. All this, is, all this will be detailed out with the cove molding, uh, done in boral. Um, and basically where this roof is covering that gutter, we'll actually may have the gutters be operating, you know, the, the wood gutters. Uh, on the rake pieces, you have these crown moldings coming up. So they'll be rebuilt with a crown molding to, to match these dimensions with this extra rake board trim board in here and the cove molding, which you can see in, in there. Uh, the corner boards are simple, uh, pretty much flat, flat boards. Um, basically the, the clapboards would be four inch clapboard, cement board by Hardy board. Uh, the trim would be boral. The casings are five quarter by four. Window sills are two inches, uh, two inch thick boral trim. Door casings and from around the doors or borrow five quarter uh, by um, four and three eighths. Yeah, by four and three eighths. And the corner boards are five quarter by six. Um, they're actually six inches borrow trim. 
and the fascia and the soffit, all of this trim up in here will be oral. Um, the windows will be the Anderson A series. They're, they're fiberglass on the outside. Uh, the window muttons are seven eighths inch, what they call a modern divided light, but they're shaped uh, sort of to give you the feel of the uh, caulked joint with a spacer bar in between. So they, they give, the, uh, give you the mutt, mutton effect we want here. On that steep uh, gable towards the water, there's an interesting crosshatch uh, textured uh, board up here. We'll, re we'll repeat that. Instead of the sawtooth shingle, we're, we're suggesting just a straight across shingle, but we'll have shingles down here, that patterning up here. Um, the roof shingles are asphalt, uh, well, 130 mile an hour rated uh, architectural style. Uh, and the valley flashing will be uh, uh, lead coated copper. Uh, for the big, for the door trim, we have these pilasters. They're they're tapered. Uh, the ideal scenario I used to used to do a building is like we'll carefully remove all these and then we can salvage them and put them put them back on for the for the new door. Whenever we can do that, likely we will replace the round columns with fiberglass columns. Uh, that are structural and, and that we can use for hold down. Uh, and then the railing will, will be uh, out of uh, PVC painted, um, be ASEC painted. Uh, we don't like the shiny uh, ASEC. A finish prime and one coat finish paints called out here. Um, the, the old railing we had, that railing I said was removed was here. The, 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 the front of the house is here to the left. So this patio has been lowered six inches since the last time. It had a railing, the railing's been removed. Um, and then the stone veneer, this is a photograph of a house on Mason's Island uh, that used this uh, thin stone veneer that, with the Connecticut coloring. Uh, and that's like only an inch and a, inch, inch and a quarter thick, these, these stones here. Uh, what a generator looks like. And then these are how, how we detail the, the wall along the street is about 32 inches high. But what we like is, this, is, is the long rectangular stones on the top of the wall. It can be random underneath, but the idea is to give a, uh, that, that uniform top. For landscape, this is a view of what the uh, metal railing would be like around the pool. Um, or there was a uh, discussion, Brian Kent, the landscape architect, uh, for permeous, permeable paving. And basically we'd have these type of uh, paving. Uh, here's the pattern and the, the color mix and the details for that. And this is a picture of the uh, five foot high privacy fence going along the property. The walkways would be bluestone, uh, you know, set on, on crushed stone, basically. And as I mentioned, the wall along the street, you can see the horizontal uh, stones across the top. We'd have that with you know, more random stones underneath. Um, nothing particularly changed on these floor plans other than that there was the railing I talked about went from here, came out across here. So it really obscured the front of the house. So that's been removed. Uh, the connector roof was removed here. Uh, and then we added the AC compressor right, right here on the platform with the generator because it has to be up. Um, this is a privacy fence, it shows brown on mine events. <laughs> you can see that, but it starts here at the house, goes all the way to Pearl Street. And then these are the security fences for the, for the pool. Um, second floor and roof plans. Uh, and then we moved to Pearl Street. Um, obviously there's no, no structure there right now. Um, to, the, to the left, to the right, to the left is 26 Pearl Street. This, this little corner is really this little, uh, it's actually, I, I think it's rented out as an Airbnb and garage, uh, is here, but this is all one property from there to here. So this is the main house and this is accessory dwelling unit, I guess. Um, 
for that property. So that's 26 Pearl Street. You go to the next house, that's 28 Pearl Street. Immediately to the right is 20 Pearl Street and 18 Pearl Street. Uh, what we did was we, if you recall, we had a driveway that, that came came in here, went around the house and connected up here and had a parking place uh, in, in front of the house. And we retained the parking place and put it coming off of Pearl Street in front of the house here and eliminated this driveway and moved this house north uh, probably about four feet, four or five feet. Uh, and the little AC compressors like right in here. But that, that opened up space between this, between the house here and the side of the house. So I think that works better here. And we're, we're certainly more uniform here. If there's a question, it says, here's the end of the wood fence from here all the way down to here uh, to show that. But we're talking about the accessory dwelling unit. There's a front porch that uh, raised porch comes down. And there's also a, a wood porch here that goes down mostly to out to the main house. Uh, the, it was a head scratcher to put a driveway here off the street, but as it turns out, uh, this is the site plan right here. Uh, right next door, you have parking, 18 Pearl Street, this is parking in front of the house, 12 Pearl Street, this is parking in front of the house. So. It's, it's not out of character of, of Pearl Street to have the parking place right here. And it kind of reflects that Gravel Street was obviously the main house with all the main street with all the mansions and what have you. Pearl Street, you know, a lot of smaller houses. Uh, some of them you can, they weave back here into parking, but uh, you know, not all of them. So we thought this is not out of character with Pearl Street to have the parking in front. Solved, solved a lot of the uh, concerns about too much driveway, if anything. Uh, from here, this is, um, you know, we, we, we put a little bit of a retaining wall to raise the, uh, give the house a little bit more of a platform grade to sit on with short steps. Uh, we like the closed in porch rather than the open lattice because you're kind of looking straight at it. I, I mean, this is kind of eye heights, it looked a little better. And, and the air compressor is really here. It's around the corner because the house indents three feet. You can't see the air compressor here. Uh, from the other side, the driveway will come in and, and kind of uh, terminate at the stone wall. Um, okay, where were we? Oh, from the back, you can see the uh, wood fence will be stepping down the slope, which would be kind of nice. It won't be just one long, equally high thing all the way down, the, all, the whole length of the lot. And um, the elevations, um, I don't think anything changed there. Uh, well, from our first presentation, we put a little bit more of a designed railing, you know, with a four inch railing to just so it's not just a straight railing. Um, Here's that air AC compressor tucked in here on the side. That's why you can't see it. It's indented the side. Um, and the details, um, what we decided is we could go ahead with aluminum gutters on the uh, accessory dwelling unit. We didn't necessarily have to re repeat the wooden gutters, uh, but the rake trim would be similar. Uh, the stone veneer you know, would be identical. Uh, all of these trim pieces are identical to what we talked in the main house, five quarter by four for window casings, hardy board, four inch clapboard, uh, A-series Anderson windows. And again, PVC railings with uh, painted and one coat of primed and then one coat of finished paint and asphalt shingles, architectural style. And the floor plans. And again, the only change is is to add the AC compressor uh, in this little alcove on a platform. Because this platform has to be the same height as the house uh, per town of Groton. Uh, so that completes my, the presentation. Um, Chris, you had, so we had some letters that uh, neighbors, we reached out to the neighbors and, and sent them uh, plans to see what they thought of it. 
Uh, maybe Christopher Knott could read those for the record. Sure. Is that okay if I read these letters into the record tonight? Yeah. Sure, they're on the, I have them saved on my screensaver. So if I'm going to share those, I could share those so I can read them also. Uh, sure. I'm going to start with uh, Gary Stramer, 29 Pearl Street, dated March 12th. Dear Mr. Birchie, the purpose oh, of this uh, letter. Chris, Chris yeah. can you see on the screen you have Edwards up first? Edmonds? Okay, sure. That's Edmonds. I will uh, I'll read that first. This is Brian and Kathleen Edmonds, 31 Gravel Street. Hello, my wife and I reside at 31 Gravel Street, and we have reviewed the plans for 17 Gravel Street. We support this plan for the property as the building retains and enhances the historical feel of Gravel Street. We believe it is very fitting and we hope the town approves this major improvement in Mystic. Thank you, Brian and Kathleen Edmonds. Uh, second letter is Gary Stramer, 29 Pearl Street, Mystic. Dear Mr. Birchie, the purpose of this letter is to express my enthusiastic support for the proposed design and renovation of the existing house and construction of new garage and a guest house on the property at 17 Gravel Street in Mystic, Connecticut. Please feel free to pass on this letter to the Groton Historic District Commission. I have lived in the Mystic Historic District for over 40 years and I am a longtime homeowner on Pearl Street. Although I do not know or have even met your client, I have watched the recent recorded HDC meetings and feel compelled as a neighbor to provide perspectives and support for this project. I completely understand the homeowner's need and desire to demolish the existing house and rebuild it. One can argue that the proposal will sustain the historic keeping of the neighborhood while also meeting the FEMA and Town of Groton flood construction standards. The proposed design will surely improve the appearance by adding an appropriately pitched roof to the rear addition and dormers on the second floor are also fitting. The proposed other buildings on the property, both the garage and the Pearl Street structure are also ideally suited and fits very well on this large parcel. Bottom line is this entire design proposal is surely appropriate for our neighborhood and in keeping with the HDC guidelines and standards. Unfortunately, I currently have a prior commitment on March 15th. However, please don't hesitate to offer my inputs and strong recommendation for the HDC to support for this project. Gary Schramer. The next one is from 21 Pearl Street, Matthew Techholtz. To who it may concern, this letter is in support of Mr. Grace's proposed renovation and construction project for 17 Gravel Street. My wife and I have lived on Pearl Street for 10 years and are happy to see continual improvement and respect to the historical significance of the area on Pearl and nearby streets. We hope the commission approves the proposed project. Sincerely, Matthew Techholz. And the last letter here, I believe, is from Jenny and Adam Wernowski to Cliff Street. Bill and Bob, thank you for the opportunity to review the improvement plans for 17 Gravel Street. We think it looks great and will be a wonderful addition to the, major, to the other major renovations you have orchestrated in our neighborhood. Similar to our house project 10 years ago, the alternative to not doing this full reconstruction project is to have the house continue to deteriorate, which is something no one wants to happen. Good luck with the project. Jenny and Adam Ronowski to Cliff Street, Mystic. Can I, can I add something? I just want for people who aren't familiar, their address is to Cliff, but their property is on gravel as well. And then another letter here from Sultan Ahmed, MD, MBNA, MBA, 
29 Gravel Street. Mrs. Sarah Moriarty and members of the Historic Commission, Town of Groton. Hello, good evening. I am Sully Ahmed and my wife Ann and I have lived at 29 Gravel Street for 38 years. I strongly support this application. I have known Mercer and Birchy Architects for a long time and they did our addition to 29 Gravel Street almost two decades ago to comply with historic requirements. Recently, Christopher Knott of that firm did the work of adding a three car garage to our property, taking into account the flood zone and historic commission requirements. I have full confidence in their work. And when it is all said and done, 17 Gravel Street will be a beautiful building, adding another great sea captain's house to the street and downtown Mystic. Thank you. Regards, Sully Ahmed. And those are the letters of support for the record. Okay. Thank you. So I, so I guess at this point, are there questions from the uh, commission? Um, Do the commission members have any additional comments or questions that they'd like to take this opportunity to ask of the applicant? I think after three presentations, I've got a pretty good handle on it. <laughs> Actually, um, if I may, I'd like to see if we can continue this. I mean, we got letters two hours before this meeting. I'd like time to look into them. One thing that concerns me is I don't know what was presented to these neighbors. You know, somebody says, well, if the only choice is demolition, and, and, and frankly, that concerned me from our last meeting when the owner said, well, and I may be paraphrasing, I apologize if, if my, my uh, memory is wrong, but if I don't get to do this, I'll just let it rot. You know, demolition by neglect doesn't sit well with me, and that's what was presented to us. So, you know, the house has stood for 180 years. They still have to go before planning and zoning. I would like a little more time to look into this before we vote on it. And I'm asking the, the commissioners to, to uh, continue into the next meeting. I don't see any reason to continue it. I mean, anybody from the public has the opportunity to come and speak. And we haven't even heard if anybody from the public's here. Um, you know, they presented letters of evidence of people who were for it. If people who were against this application, they absolutely have the opportunity at this meeting to voice their opinion. And I personally know almost everybody on that list, and they would not have written that endorsement if they weren't in full support of it. I don't know them though, Bonnie. <laughs> well, yeah, just, I mean, just because you pick and choose a couple neighbors to write letters in support, I don't think necessarily is indicative of the, uh, you know, the opinions of the neighbors. I also agree with John, submitting it, you know, a couple hours beforehand is, I don't know. Everyone has the opportunity to come forward at this hearing. You know, they presented letters, other applicants have presented letters, and if people want to speak, they can. And, you know, I, I'm not going to continue the hearing to, to make sure that the people who submitted letters were vetted correctly. I mean, the application needs to stand on its merits. I have a procedural question. Are we, are there two separate applications, one for the demolition and one for the new construction or is it all one? It's all one. I don't believe it can be, but. Yeah, don't we have to vote on the demolition separately and then the construction separately? I had to submit a demo application and notice the demo. That has a 90 day review period and you'd have to submit a separate HTC application. Peter, I'll let you feel that one. I'm not entirely sure. My lawyers looked into it for three Water Street. So, Peter. Yeah, I guess they technically demo should be a separate application. So, what's the application look like? Well, let's pull it up. So just one application was submitted. Eric, the 90 day review period, is that HDC or is that PNZ? That's, that's a state statute yeah, for historic but, district demolitions. Yeah. Okay. But the historic district commission can approve a demolition and you can wait the 90 days for the state. They are not- Correct, you can, it's, an, it's an appeal process. So you got 90 days for any regular appeal. Yeah. Right, right. They could concurrently submit two applications. I mean, we did that. That's fine, but it had to be done separately. 
Otherwise, exactly. they can through with the application to, for the work, and then I guess come back for a demo application. But that would be kind of strange. I don't understand why it can't be on the same form. I, I would encourage you to read the state statutes and waste money on attorneys like I did. <laughs> Peter, what do oh, you the suggest? HTC form? No. I again would encourage you to read the state statutes and waste money on attorneys like I did. Well, who, who rules on the demolition? We rule on both, but we just rule on them separately. Right, Peter? You need to notice the demolition application separate. So it was noticed in the paper because they read the call. I'm assuming, well, let's look at what the call said. Peter, can you go to the call? So what was noticed was demolition of house and garage and construction of house and detached garage. So it was noticed. But do we have a procedural issue where it's on one app and not two? Where, well, that's what I'm asking. I don't, I mean, it was noticed, which is the requirement that we need to satisfy. Um, so I'm, I'm asking, I'm sorry, put you on a spot, Peter. Um, I would hate to vote on this and then to have a, it procedurally come back and bite us. Um, well, I think the I, intent is, vote, is basically to have them come, separately. Do we satisfy the requirement? If you voted on them separately, the demolition from the other one. Right. So if I don't, and I don't know. I can read right from the, the handbook itself for the demolition. All right. So you, then you can make your own assessment of this. Okay. Any proposed demolition of a building or structure in the LHD, uh, LHP that's visible from a public way subject to the review, regardless of whether a demolition permit is required. Certificate of appropriateness is required before a demolition permit can be issued by the building official. So the, in order to get the building official's approval for the demolition. Under the statute, the HDC has the authority to impose a demolition delay up to 90 days once a demolition permit has been issued for any building or structure in the historic district. The demolition delay does not apply if the building official has certified that there's unsafe or dangerous conditions. The 90-day demolition delay gives the HDC and other advocates time to research and document the historic building, consult with the property owner on alternatives to demolition, and to find or to find potential purchase to preserve the building or relocate it. The delay can be lifted at any time by written consent by both the HDC or HPC and CCT. Well, we've well, had- uh, Can I jump in here? Can you read the first sentence? Because if I heard you correctly, nothing said separate application. It just said an application. Right. right. Two. Okay. The separate thing came from the state statutes. All right, well, let's look and, at all, and also, it, it seems like they're laying groundwork if you just wanted to demolish it and you didn't have plans for it, the 90 days is to find out plans for it. So basically what we're offering is like, yes, we will de demolish it and here are detailed plans of what we intend to replace it with. And it would seem you wanna tie those together legally, you know, rather than, oh, you can de demolish it, we get it all torn down. It's like, well, we weren't really required to rebuild anything. I, can I speak, Sarah? Of course you can. I'm just looking up the statute right now. I don't, I, I, I think we're um, splitting hairs here and we've seen this applicant twice before in a preliminary. And if anybody on this commission had these concerns, we should have brought it up at the preliminary. I, I don't disagree with you. I, and I hear where you're coming from, but I would hate for this. I agree to be approved and then challenged because of a procedural issue. And Bonnie, I think splitting hairs is important. We've had, although not saying there's one applicant where we didn't and it's continuing to bite us in the rear. So I think making sure that everybody's T's are crossed and I's are dotted is, you know, it's, it's I think uh, being overly cautious is better. Yeah, yeah, if, I could, if I could address Mr. Mr. Goodrich real quick because you sort of put words in my mouth. Um, of course, sir. There. And I, I asked you to correct me if they were wrong, sir. So, I, which, which, right, right. And I'm not going to get, get spooky about it. I just, um, I mean, we're, we're all adults in the room here. Obviously, no one's letting anything rot. My, my, my premise was, which I explained at the last hearing, you're dealing with a, a very dilapidated building with vinyl siding and blown in insulation, et cetera, et cetera. We all know we have developers on this committee that have projects all over the state for that matter. 
And uh, we all know $172,000 isn't going to do much to that house. I, I clearly have the means. I own it now. I would have the ability to resell the house, to put it back on the market, um, et cetera. My, my point is there are other alternatives that aren't going to get to the same ends. And, and, and for it to sit there or spend 171000 and get not much out of it just isn't common sense. And once you get to $172,000, we do not have a choice but to raise it the required three feet. Once you raise it the required three feet, the engineering requires that everything basically comes down and you're putting tie downs and hold downs and the rest of the structural uh, pressure treated wood, the whole thing. So it ends up coming down anyway. With this method, I'm an engineer myself. With this method to approach it, we're able to demolish it, reset the foundation properly, get rid of all the the uh, the, the granite and grubble that's underneath the place and, and reset a nice residence for the rest of, at least my wife and I's time that we think, um, and, and a whole general property setup. My, my point was the next person either may, may or may not be able to do that and you don't know um, what's gonna happen to it and it may sit there like it did for the last 10 years, um, just the way it is. So that was really the premise of what I was saying. I don't, I'm not going to sit there and own it and let it rot. Right, I appreciate I, you clarifying I, that, sir. I appreciate yeah, that. Can I, can I mention oh, something? Speak. Yeah, Bill, let me just say one thing because I just want to jump on that note for a second. Sorry. Um, John, I don't want to speak for you as well, but I don't think it's directly relating to you rebuilding the house. I think the concern is is what's for, for the fabric of the community and what this does. These homes have been there for hundreds of years. Some of them have rotted, some of them have not. I've redone some, I've not redone others. You're taking a house that's been there, you're taking something that's been photographed for my entire life and then some, and you're taking it down and you're starting from scratch. And you're blaming it on FEMA or you're blaming it on, well, I can't only do it in one year or whatever else it is, but you're ripping it down and you're ripping down a piece of, of this town, something somewhere I was born and I raised and I chose to come back to and that's going to give other people the ability down the road to just continue to do that. I think we should really be rehabbing properties if, if, if anything. And, you know, I, I think you're creating what Todd has always referred to as a fake history. And I don't like it. And I don't think it's correct. And I don't think it's when the historic district guidelines. So I understand your point. It's very difficult to rebuild. I get it. I, I build things all the time. Like, that's what I do now. I get it. I get what you're saying. I just don't think it's right. And that's my point. And Eric, have you, had, mean, to you, have you had to demolish things in order to build things? Of course I have. I demolished two buildings on Water Street, but the reality is they have no historic significance. They weren't photographed, but had it been the original stables from 1800s and I wanted to rebuild my building, I wouldn't have demolished it. I don't care what the money was. That's my personal ethics and my personal opinion of the community. Some place I rode my bike around, some place I walked around, and some people place the people before me did the same thing and walked by that house for 200 years. It's just wrong. And, and Eric, uh, you put you could have said it better. I mean, you you've said just what I was thinking. And and Bill, I'm gonna put it out there too. I mean, I'm looking at your flood map. It covers 20% of the historic district. So what's what precedent are we setting if you and Mr. Grace, with all due respect, if you buy a piece of property for less than the property value, you tear the house down and, and build new because we're going to use FEMA as an excuse. It it doesn't sit well with me either. And and you know what? Owning a historic house really doesn't have ROI. I live in a house from 1740. The money I'm investing in it and will invest in it, I'll never get back out. But it's a choice to preserve a piece of history that is the fabric of our town. All right. FEMA, is not, an historic, FEMA oh, is not an excuse for all, with all respect. It is a law. I can't change that. If there was no FEMA, I could rebuild that or not rebuild it. I could remodel the house and, and, and take everything you're saying. That I don't have a choice. No, you do. You can do it year after year. Like you oh, said, sure. You Come on. Year. You're a builder, Eric. You're, you're going to have bulldozers in the not there every, every, every okay, year. Okay, I think and everyone said everything that they want to say. And I've just gone through the statutes and I see no, I don't see anywhere where it has to be a separate, separate application. And, and can I mention something? Yes. Um, you know, in terms of the um, demolition, the 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 actual demolition permit would be will come from the town, will be you know out of the zoning office, planning and zoning office, and the building office. HDC is is a certificate appropriateness. You're saying you're basically that certificate saying it's appropriate that we approve this scope of work. That that's what your certificate appropriateness means. 
zoning can't go ahead with, with demolition. They may still have to wait 90 days by their statutes, but the 90 days doesn't apply to HDC. You know, basically you're saying whether it's appropriate or not to demo it. You know, so the 90 days does actually apply to the HDC. Once the HDC has approved a demolition permit, there is a 90 day appeal, appeal period specific to the HDC. Oh, okay, um, all right, okay. But I don't see anywhere, and I just read that, that's why I know that. Um, okay. But I don't see anywhere where the applications need to be separate. I mean, perhaps it was a, a byproduct along the way if people wanted to get their house approval to demolish before they had their plans, I'm not sure, but. It, it doesn't appear necessary. So, you know, I'm comfortable moving forward on one application. Yeah. I am too. So, I, I, and I guess I put it to you, Bill and Mr. Grace, if you're comfortable moving forward on one application because it's your application. I'm comfortable moving forward. I don't, that's, that's from Bill. Dan? Uh, yes, I'm comfortable. Okay. All right, that being said, does anyone have any additional questions or comments for the applicant? Is this okay. time for just the us or for the public as well? I No, I haven't closed the public hearing yet. So okay. um, if the applicant doesn't have anything further and the commission members don't have any additional questions, is anyone here in the audience that would like to oh, speak? Can I, ask one, can I just ask one question real quick? Absolutely. Is anyone from the commission Planning on challenging this based on what I've heard. If this, without vetting this with my own attorneys, I mean, now, now I'm a little nervous that it's going to get challenged internally. It can't get challenged internally, but no. a resident of the of the community or a property owner could challenge it, myself included. That's what I was afraid of. Thank you. Um, but I would remind you that <clears throat> the appeals process, and I'm sure Sarah can jump in as well, is costly, and I have other priorities. Mr. Grace, do you have any other questions? Okay. Would anyone in the audience like to speak for this application? Yes, I would. Okay, Mr. Keatsman, go ahead. I think it's a good application. I think it's fitting. Thank you. And you've been in a lot of our meetings, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, would anyone else in the audience like to speak for this application? Yes, Bonnie. I don't want to compromise myself because I'm a voting member, but I do live on Pearl Street and I can speak to those letters and I know those people and they weren't people, I'm sure, whose arms got twisted. They, um, they're good, decent folks and I think it's a, um, appropriate for our neighborhood. I, I don't have any doubt that those people did those letters um, because they truly think it's a good, app, a good appropriate house for the neighborhood. Thank you. Would anyone in the audience like to speak against this application? I would like to speak for it. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead, Ms. Crawford. Okay, I'm Sue Crawford. I live at 26 Pearl Street, right next door. And um, I, honestly think the land has just been derelict for so long, rotted fences. Um, I think it'll be a vast improvement. Thank you. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak for this application? There's somebody. Uh, Mr. Bourgeois, Mr. Bourgeoisie, you're muted. Still muted. Muted. Now I'm here. Oh, there now you I'm are. Here. We can hear you now. Go I'm ahead. sorry, I raised my hand, but nobody was, you know, calling me. <laughs> uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Arnaud Bourgeois. I live on 13 Gravel, so two houses down of uh, Dan. I've never, I met Dan once for a few minutes, and he sent me the information, uh, and the last revised plan that I got was uh, last night. Uh, my question, I'm not, uh, not against of or whatever, but I've got a question uh, for the commission. Uh, I'm coming from a town in Woodbury, Connecticut, and I, was, I lived in a house for 25 years that was built in 1765 or 1785. And uh, so I deal with, with meetings like this many times. Uh, and my question is, 
there's a big change on the house that's being proposed. And the big change is the shed dormer for me. You have a house who has, doesn't have a second floor. I mean, it has a second floor, but you don't see any window except the triangle in the front. And they're trying to keep the old integrity of the historical part of the house. But on top of that, we're adding two, four windows, dormers, on a shed dormer in the front of the street, in the front of the river. Uh, if that's the case, uh, I don't know. I've not. I've been walking around a little bit and trying to find another house that was facing the river with dormers like this. I found none of them. Most of the houses are oriented another way. The longitudinal axis is more uh, north, uh, east, west. Okay, this one is like mine a little bit. We're facing the river, and. That means that I'm afraid that you guys are opening a big can of worm here because next guy who's going to ask for dormers is going to be me. And anybody else who's got, who feels like, uh, oh, uh, let's do some major change on the house, going to say, look, I want to do some major change, but it's too much money. Uh, I'm ready to spend more money than what I can really do every year or every two years. So because of this, I'm just going to dose the house, raise it up to FEMA, and then I'll be okay because you've done it before. You approve it before. So I think that the commission has to really look at maybe all their drawing on the proposed house um, and see what could it be made to look more like it is now. And then I heard some other thing that was troublesome for me is like PVC railing. Is that historically talking? If we're going to do PVC railing, or facial stone instead of real stone, we're not even using material that are historically talking here. So there's a lot of things here that have been, and that, that everything has been thrown out in, you know, it's, there's three buildings there. And I understand that, you know, two meetings have been consumed, but I think it's a, I think dosing a house on the historical place like here on that beautiful gravel street, to rebuild something, I think it's a big deal. And, and, and I think the commission has to be very careful about how they approach it. That's it. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Any other audience members that would like to speak for or against this application? I don't wanna miss anybody. So I'm just, Jim, Catherine, Ann, and Lauren, are you all here for pre-apps? I know that sometimes we have technical difficulties. I'm gonna take that as a yes. Okay, with no additional comments from the audience, the applicant, or the commission members, I am going to close this application. HDC, thank you, 22-10. So we already voted on the others. So I'm gonna open deliberations on HDC 22-10, 17 Gravel Street, Jennifer Grace, owner, Christopher Knott, applicant. This was the proposal of the demolition of the house in the garage and construction of a new house and detached garage and ancillary structure. Comments or motions? I'd like to make a motion to approve this application. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my screen squared away. It moved on me. May I make some final comments before we, we go on body's motion? Is that okay? Yeah. Elsa. I, I mean. Oops. Well, actually, you don't because we don't have the second yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just one of the comments too is in light of what was raised about me having a conflict of interest relative to the the brewery. I'm not sure Bonnie should even be voting respectfully. She knows well, all the neighbors and she lives she, around. The I absolutely disagree, and you voted on that application. So, yeah, but I, now you have to revote on that because there was a, a perceived conflict of interest. I don't even know the owner. I've never met. Yeah, him. I don't I think know the owner of the brew pub. So, I. It, it's up to Bonnie to recuse herself. Although I don't think that she has a conflict of interest. Nor does I do she not have a conflict of interest. I. Why did I have a conflict of interest with the brew pub? I didn't say you did. 
I have no idea. I don't even recall that issue. So, um, any other comments? Yeah, I would just like to finish up. And I think everybody knows I'm not for this project. I'll say that for the record. You know, I'm going to say again, you look at the flood map they provided us. I agree with what Mr. Bourgeois said. It's it's a can of worms. So what we're going to open up if we approve this is everybody in that flood zone will be able to come and say, well, you know, here it is. We got to comply with FEMA. You know, it, and at the end of the day, with all due respect to Mr. Grace, what I've heard on the pre-apps in this one is it's in a flood zone. The house is ugly. It needs work. The addition's an abortion. He knew all of that before he bought the house. None of that's a surprise. And, you know, I tip my hat to him as a businessman. Yeah, he bought it for less than land value. Good for him. But that then opened up anybody that can buy a house that an elderly person has owned because they've owned it their whole life. And there's a number of them in that area. And maybe due to their age or their circumstances, the house gets some disrepair and somebody buys it inexpensively. And now we're tearing houses down. I, you know, it, if I may, and I'm just going to pull it up, it says in our handbook that part of our job is to, and I want to quote it properly here, so please give me one minute. I'll pull it right Mr. up. Gillers, do you know how much I bought the house for? Mr. Grace, property? I'm sorry, you can't comment in this part of the application. Thank you. Well, I go back to, uh, we don't have a second for Bonnie's motion. I second. Okay. Oh, so I can't finish saying what I was going to say? Absolutely. No. Okay. Um, all right. All right. <laughs> You're not supposed to have discussion until there's a second in Robert's rules. Oh, Don I apologize. Very good at keeping us procedurally appropriate. It, should, I, should I wait till the second? Or, I apologize. No, I already second. There is a okay. Second. All right. Now. now. Um, it says. It says the mandate is so. This is page nine of our handbook. The mandate of the commission is to preserve and, whenever possible, enhance the historical and architectural characteristics of the town's historic district. I mean, that 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 is our, our mandate. I don't think we're following that. If that's we not a mandate, this. that's just the handbook. Okay, just, just, that's our handbook and I don't think we're hand. following it. But definitely not a mandate. Okay. Um, you know, my, my comment, we, we've demolished or approved other demolitions in the district. We approved one right up the street. It's typically when a house falls into significant disrepair and it's just not feasible. Um, I don't have a problem with this. I think that his improvements will benefit both Gravel and Pearl Street. Um, so those are my comments. Just out of curiosity, yeah. what, what did we approve? We approved the library demolition. We approved my demolition. There's a corner lot right up on Port Pearl. Not, it's not Pearl, but it's as you, as you turn. Grove. Thank you. Oh, you're, before, you're, you're talking back. Oh. So. It wasn't all that long ago. Oh, well, years seven. blend, but we, we approved um, the demolition on Cliff Street. Yep. Uh, may I say something, please? And you know, I understand. I understand, John, where you're coming from, but I think that you're a little, you're being a little bit more, um, you're exaggerating the potential impact. We take every single one of these applications on its own merits. We're not bound by anything we've done before, nor anything we do in the future. And I think that when we look at this house and we look at its condition and we, and we look at what the end result is, there may be things that you can quibble with about the design, but I've always maintained that from the beginning of the creation of Mystic till now, all of the former homeowners who were lived in the 1700s and the 1800s were free to make changes to their houses, changing a colonial house to an Italianate house. I mean, those things have occurred many times before so that I still don't see that there's a real issue with changing the appearance of a house as long as what you appear to uh, change it to is not incongruous with the neighborhood. We, our charge is to, to attempt to preserve the houses that are in the district, but we're not prohibited from permitting people to change their appearance or certain attributes. And, and I, I think that's the way it should be. And so that's sort of where, sort of where I come down on it. And, I, and as I said, just because we decided something today on this house, we could decide something totally different on the next house. And it's, you know, is it a wholly objective process? It's not really, it gets somewhat subjective, but that's just sort of the way it is. Well, well um, I got my speech here. Uh, I know I missed one of the pre-hearings on this case, but I'm not quite clear what is so bad about the condition of the house as it currently stands. And pull up the I, pictures. Hmm? 
Pull up the pictures again. I'll show you. Well, I mean, you know, crazy That's suggestion possibly, but I remember Mr. Grace invited us to look at it. Maybe we should do that before we vote on it if he's that offer still open for him. Because I'm with Don. I don't know what's so bad about it. I, I've heard, I haven't seen. It's not. It was rented out this summer. People were, were renting it. They were living in it. I mean, is there something structurally wrong with the house? I mean, Bonnie, if it's that bad, it shouldn't have been rented. No, I mean, does anybody know? Is there something structurally wrong with it? I don't, I've never been in it. The no, front we haven't heard any, we haven't heard any. Bonnie, if you've never been in it, then how do you know? From the exterior, Eric, let me finish. walking I, by I mean, it. I don't think we've gotten any evidence about the structural integrity this, of the house. See this front porch here on 17 Gravel? I think um, the owner, Dan, has fixed this. The thing over the door was at a um, list for years. Then and go to the back, the back view. The, the fence has been falling down for years. I don't know. There is a picture of the back. So respectfully, the, the fence is the structural integrity of the house and my house. No, no, the back of the house, um, this oh, back the rear. The, the, if you think this back rear of the house is a significant architectural house view, uh, you've got to convince me because that is an ugly, unhistoric view. Same with the south elevator. <laughs> Yeah, stepping back, I, I don't, I wouldn't disagree with ripping the rear of the house off, but that's a whole different, that's getting back to the discussion from two meetings ago, or whatever it was. Or back to the original discussion when they sought approval to, to take off the front thing, whatever that thing was, and the porch thing on the back, whatever they removed, I, I don't disagree with that. But I think the core of the house, I, I don't, I don't disagree with John. And body, I mean, you know, you've been in my house before I purchased it, there's not a flat surface anywhere in this house and it's not falling down old houses will have a little bit of give and but it's part of their charm wow does anyone have any other comments on this application before we vote no okay i'll do roll call uh no i moriarty i levinson nay brady aye uh, Goodman. No. Yeah. The application is approved. All right. Where are we? Pre-application hearings. Um, Susan Jim? Crawford is a uh, pre yep, Susan Crawford was for Jim. Yes. But please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yep, we can hear you. Okay, hi. Sue Crawford, 26 Pearl Street, uh, Mystic. I am looking for uh, approval to add a 15 foot addition to my existing shed on my property. And I believe Peter has a download of the street view. All right, give you me one see. second.
All right, I found it. Hang on a second. Okay. Bear with me. It's a little tricky. All right, here we go. Yep. You can see the, um, the tip of the roof line, which hasn't been shingled yet. Um, actually, it's behind the, the um, arborvitaes. So is that your shed? That's yeah. the, yeah, it's the shed is on the right here, the small building behind the carriage house. Um, and it's going to come off the back side by 15 feet. Kind of, it's, it's going to be basically directly behind the carriage house. I'm coming off the shed. The shed has the, it's the third little building. Um, So I'm confused. That's, You're looking to add to your existing shed. Correct. And your existing shed is what we're looking at now. Correct. In this, in this non, um, the roof that doesn't have the shingles on it is where the addition is. Correct. Okay. Yeah, basically the work was being done and uh, one of the inspectors went out and noticed it was being done without a permit. So gotcha. we, okay. we notified yeah. that they had to come in to HTC and get the approval and then get the building permit spread away. To be honest with you, I didn't think it was even going to be visible. Um, my builder started it when I was on vacation and I came back and uh, uh, realized I had to take care of that. So, okay, here I am. <laughs> okay, so you need to put in an application. Um, there should be, you should get a checklist when you put the application in of all of the things that you need to submit, um, photos from, uh, public ways, what it's going to look like, the dimensions, the materials that you're going to use, um, and then come back. Okay. Um, I've been through this many times um, with HTC. Uh, from my gathering, you are just subjecting to what you can see from the street, correct? Exactly. So, well, I mean, you, you need to sh show us what you're doing, but we're really, our jurisdiction is things from a public this, scene from street, a public yeah room. yeah and that's really the only view that you can see right there okay. um, it, it's not just your street it's you know any any street, street. that you can yeah see that. right yeah you can't see it from any other streets um i know that for a fact and you might just want to take a picture from another street to say look you can't see sure it. yep um, happy to do that so yep okay so you just want the shingles the it's all, it's going to be the same materials that are used on the existing shed um but I have the book showing that. Um, I can bring that with me. Perfect. And it's possible that our next meeting might be in person. I heard that. That's good. It makes it simpler. <laughs> I'm not a good Zoom person. No. Okay. Um, does anyone have any additional information they want to provide the applicant or the potential applicant? Well, just it, so you want to have drawings of what you're doing. Yep. My builder's going to do a rendering. All right. Okay. All right, very good. We'll see you next okay, time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Andrea, are you here for a pre-app? Um, no, for um, old business. Okay, all right. Um, hold on one moment. Is anyone else here for a pre-app? No. Okay. Um, public communications, Peter? Yeah, bear with me. I'm trying to pull one up here. Hang on a second. Can you see that? Yes. Is this the old business that we were talking about? Yeah, this is actually segueing into what she was here for. Andrea okay. was here for, so might as well bring it up. This is from. You want me to read Zanarini. it into the record? Sure. Okay. Uh, to Historic District Commission from Tom Zanarini, Code Enforcement Officer, Player One, date March 15, 2022. Subject to the Orchard Lane Fence Field Observations. 
I was asked to inspect the chain link fence along the side and rear property lines of three Orchard Lane. The chain link fence was identified in a fence permit that was previously approved by the HDC. A neighbor has complained that the chain link fence is visible from the street. My observations are as follows. The chain link fence is not immediately visible from the front of three Orchard Lane. A solid fence facing the street was erected as approved by the HDC. The lot slopes from front to back, making portions of the fence visible in the distance. The chain link fence is visible from Boston Post Road, but only when viewed across a neighbor's property. The HDC handbook does not give direction on fences from this view. The handbook only addresses fence designs as viewed from the front of the property. The fence is not visible from Ashby Street. The upward slope is too great and the house property at 17 Ashby obstructs the view. It is my opinion that the fence construction at Three Ocean Lane is in compliance with the HDC application as approved. Tom Zanarini. Hi. Um I'm sorry, this is Andrea Katsinis. Um, I don't live at 17 Ashby Street. I live at 17 New London Road. Um, so I'm a little confused about this because it is visible from uh, the right of way, the public right of way on New London Road, which is Route 1. And it's quite visible. Um. I think the issue was that when we approved it, we discussed about the visibility changing from the wood to the chain link. Mm -hmm. I think someone just needs to go back to the, not the minutes, because the minutes don't explain enough, but go back to the meeting and find what we agreed upon. Because there was a point in which we allowed the chain link. I just don't remember what that point was. But the intent from what I remember was have wood visible where visible um can we see that letter started. again now that she's mentioned that the address was wrong right yeah that's what i was asking looking for well even if you go back to tom's letter the fact is what she's saying is correct which is if you walk down new london road you look to the right across her property you can see the chain link fence But the, the reality is, is if we did approve it, possibly an error, um, we did approve it. If we didn't approve it, that's a different story. Well, based on Tom's letter, the, the um, fence is in compliance with what we approved, regardless of what street address he was looking at it from. I guess we can ask i Peter don't to, think that 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 he just interpretation of that is right because i my understanding is it's not just from the front of the property it's from any street view well but but i mean to eric's point if we approved it we approved it no i well, know but hit the comment in this letter i don't think is accurate Oh, okay. The, the HTC guidebook gives direction on fences that are that are on the front of the property. That that's correct. I don't think it really goes into a lot of detail relating to other fences off the top of my head, ones that run down the side or the rear of the property. But the point is, is that it, you're correct. We do have jurisdiction over anything within a public or anything within public view, and this does. The thing is, is from what I remember. We went, there was a lot of back and forth between two meetings relative to if you could see the chain link fence, which is why we asked them to extend the wood fence. So if we asked them to extend the wood fence and we didn't ask them to extend it far enough and we did an error or screwed up and our intent wasn't achieved, we made an error and it was just wrong, but it's approved. If it wasn't extended to the point where it's supposed to be extended to, then it wasn't built properly, and that's an that's an issue. But somebody well, needs to go back to the actual minute, to the actual meeting, not the minutes, because the minutes are. When was like, it approved? Like I don't recall. Year and a half ago, Don. I think, it, it, I think it, was it was in July, sir. Yeah, because it was my my first meeting was July first. That's why I remember it. Hmm. That's what you, yeah, um, almost a year ago. Can uh, I ask a question, possibly? I don't know if I'm well, allowed on, to hold hear. On for, I'm sorry, hold sir. on for one second. Um, as I recall the, mini, the meeting, I don't know that we even considered the view from uh, this lady's property. 
or from Route 1 when we were approving it? No, we did because it was specifically that side where we had her extend the wood fence down to London Road where it was, it was not, I think not, vi the chain link wasn't visible anymore. But again, I, someone's got to go back to the actual yeah. meeting, not the minutes. Either I, I'm losing my memory or I wasn't at that meeting because I don't remember it. So Tom Zanarini, I can see his confusion because there is a 17 New London Road and a 17 Ashby. Um, but you know, if you go to 17 New London Road and stand in the road and take a picture, I'm not quite sure because I'm looking at GIS now, not GIS, Google Street View. I'm not quite sure how you could see the fence, but I mean, I'm just looking at a map. So sure. May I share my screen if I can pull up? I showed it at a couple of meetings ago. I just don't know how to share my screen. Sarah, I yeah. walk down that way every day. So do you see it? Off. Yeah, you can see it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, sorry, I was gonna say the same thing. I drive up there to see my parents every day and, and I can see it from the car. Yeah, okay. I, I'm, like I said, I'm just looking at a map. It's it's tough to, to be able to tell. Am I allowed to speak at all? Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't wanna interrupt anyone, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, so from, and I don't sit in your shoes and I really don't know much about this, but from my looking at the application, um, there were a couple things that kind of jumped out at me, um, and I didn't see this application. I didn't know anything about this until the fence went up. Um, and um, when I looked at the application, it was interesting because the view from New London Road that was taken, if you look at the actual application, was very, very limited um, and not really showing my property at all. It showed a small, very end section of um, a picket fence that's in front of my house, a yellow picket fence. Um, and it didn't display what the appearance was at all in terms of looking down the property um, to where the fence would be. Um, I also thought that the, the discussion about the picket fence was relating to the three orchard view lane. Um, and from what I could see in the application to make sure that the picket fence that they were installing on Three Orchard was not was going to mask, if you will, um, any view of the chain link fence. Um, so um, that's it. I just I was very surprised when this happened. It is very visible from the street, from anywhere you are <laughs> in the street, and um, it's very prominent. Um, there's no way I can build up my wall, you know, to mask it from the street. Um, it's just, it would be raising it up for, you know, several feet um, back there. Um, so so your I, property, does your property abut the chain link fence, Andrea? So there's, um, it does, yeah. Um, and the, the chain link fence is on the property line? Uh, yeah, it's slightly behind the property line, but it, it is... And you have um, a stone wall on your side. I have a stone wall on my side. And again, I can bring up a picture. It's a little, it's from when it last snowed. Um, uh, I'm not sure how. There's a green rake share screen button if, if you. Uh, I'm trying to find the picture though. Oh. First. I'm sorry. I'm not very good with all of this. The only thing um, is. We can't really re-deliberate whether or not it's appropriate, but we can go back and see whether or not it, what was built was approved. But based on Tom's letter, it, it appears that way. Like that's mm. what I was saying earlier is regardless from which, which street he was looking at, he said that the fence was built per HDC approval. I mean, I don't know if he measured it, but that's what his letter well, says. I would just ask him if he did it off of the minutes, because if you do it off the minutes, anything sounds like it was approved. Anything sounds like what what, what is built was approved. Mm -hmm. I I would check the minutes. You know. Okay. All right. Not the minutes. The the, the recording. Minutes. Sorry. Right. Um, can I share my screen? Sure. I'm hoping I'm gonna. Oh, that's not what I was looking for. Um. Hold on. I'm not very good at this, my apologies. Mm. 
Nope, still not coming up. Is that coming through? Yes. Okay. So that's from, and I'm zooming in, I'm actually standing here on, there's a sidewalk if you're familiar with this area, the property was built out of the, not the property, the road used to be a big wide road and they kind of built it out to slow traffic down. Um, I don't know, we worked on that about, that must have been about 10 years ago. Um, and um, so that's my so stone wall. And that's are you the on the street? You're on the street. I'm standing um, here either on the, so it, it, it loops out and I think I zoomed in here, but um, I, there, I'm standing on the other side of my fence and I'm standing on the sidewalk that's on this built out area that's okay. up towards the street. Which is public property. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that black line is the top of the chain link fence. Yes. And um, I can see if I have on the other side, it's much more prominent past my, my black walnut. Um, mm -hmm. On the corner, it sticks up about three feet above the, um, the wall. It goes, the, the, the fence is kind of interesting. They didn't, it's not level. <laughs> it goes with the, the flow of the, the, the way that the landscape. Right the land. Yes. Um, and is that is that stone wall? Is that, is that part of the stone wall that's just fallen down over it where you're? Yeah, but the, um, this is if you can see right up here. I don't know if my cursor is showing. Yeah, I can see it. Um, yeah, I can see this it. is the fence. This is the 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 area of you know the level of the stone wall, and it, it you know would come over here. I have a black walnut that's right here. You can see the branches um, down here. Yeah, I have someone repairing it um, later this year, but I mean it's going to come up to this level. It's not going to come up higher. Um, so, um, but I, I just, I was curious whether it was considered from the public right of way because my reading of the guidelines indicated that it should not be visible from a public right of way. Um, and, um, so I, someone had asked where my property was that abuts. So back here where this, the children's play toys are, that's three orchard lane, obviously just the fence there is there. Um, and there's a house over um, to the right of this view that's on the corner. And then there's three orchard lane going up orchard lane. Okay. So, you know, Eric's suggestion was to go back and, and make sure that what we discussed applies. I mean, really, it, it's what's on the approved certificate of appropriateness. Um, so if that's not specific, then I guess, yes, you can delve into what we discussed at the meeting. Um, you know, Tom's provided a letter that says he reviewed it and said that it complies. I mean, I suppose we can ask him to double check but I don't know, Peter, what the what the town's position on that is. No, the only other thing I could do is I could have him expand on the letter a little further because he did review the file. So we right. we should clarify that he has the right addresses since there's two properties that have similar addresses. But what I'm just trying to say is there was a specific discussion regarding to the length of the wood versus the chain link. Right. I remember. If it, None of that's specific in the approval. It just says approval for the fence or whatever. So we should have been more specific in the approval, but if we don't have the details in the approval, he should go back and watch the meeting again and, and double check it against his notes. Because reviewing the file is, sorry, Peter, worthless. You're gonna get the approval and maybe any supporting documentation. You're not gonna get the discussion. Well, didn't discussion... the supporting documentation have the length of the fences in a, in a, in a sketch? Yeah, he gave a sketch with a study plan layout showing all the depiction of where the picket fence was, where the chain link fence was, and where all the different fences were. Right. And he probably should have included that in his letter so we could have taken a look at it right now. And that's what I was saying. May I get him to expand on his letter? Okay. Okay. That would <laughs> can, be I, can I make one comment about the, the application? Is if you look at the kind of top-down look of where the fences are laid out, um, 
uh, you see, I, I'm pretty sure it shows orchard and I don't have it in front of me, but in front of my house, you know, it, it's cut off showing that there is actually a street out there. Um, so it just shows that there's a property, but it doesn't show that there's a street mm -hmm. um, or, you know, public right of way. So um, I don't know if this was even viewed, um, you know, from this perspective or presented that this would be viewable, visible. Well, I mean, all we can do is make sure that the what was constructed was in accordance with what we approved. We can't even if they didn't show, you know, this view, we can't reopen and re-deliberate on an application that's been approved. So the best we can do is just make sure that what they built complies with what we approved. I, I understand. Um, in, in terms of what they what they built, I guess it's a little disappointing, you know, from a property owner for me, you know, when I've had to come before, you know, this commission for a porch in my house and a fence, which was a picket fence, um, you know, I, I just, in terms of the requirements, I just feel that the view from my property should have been considered too, not just the view from Orchard Lane. And I think that's required under the, your requirements under your your guidelines and I, I i just am trying to understand why that was not considered it, it may have been i would have to go back and look at the meeting i i want to bring something up in new business that might address some some of this okay all right let me jump to the agenda and figure out where we are um, we were in public communications and then we did old business. Let's do approval of the minutes for March 1, 2022. Um, I move to approve. Uh, there's just one comment yes. relating to the Mystic Art Association stuff. It was approved subject to the use of concrete curbing and that wasn't included in there. So that should be modified. Okay. You mean the actual approval? Like the, the approval was subject because his... his specification just said typical mm -hmm. but we wanted to be clear that all the curbing that was replaced was done out of concrete not the mismatch of asphalt and concrete and granite that's there now okay. so be at least uniform but the the minutes don't say that so i want to make sure we're not back to this problem all over again right um hold on one second let me look Uh, all right, so I'm looking at the actual approval um, and, it, and you're right, it doesn't say it. So Linda, this question is to you, can we do an amended certificate of appropriateness that includes that language? I don't know if you want to read it back into the records just put into the minutes or if you actually want to be put into the letter of appropriateness. So I guess you got me that determination. In the letter of appropriateness. Yeah, my preference would be the letter of appropriateness if if that's okay. I'm noting we can work on that. Okay. All right. Um, I move to approve the March 1, 2022 minutes second um, i second it so but i With think it was amend the minutes to include so maybe we shouldn't maybe you shouldn't amend. approve it uh, sarah what maybe you shouldn't approve it yet just but, yeah that's the direction i was thinking so let's yeah. not approve them yeah okay or i moved to i moved to i withdraw my second yeah um procedurally we would just continue this and then request that they be amended. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Eric. Any other old business? I just want to revisit this whole brew pub thing because now I'm pretty irate after this last discussion. If I had a conflict of interest that's requiring you to take another vote before we can even take any action on the brew pub, why does Bonnie not have a conflict of interest relative to that and should have recused herself? So I'm not sure why you think that Bonnie has a conflict of interest. The town attorney reviewed the meeting 
and believed that your behavior in the meeting influenced other members and that you had a conflict of interest and then a new vote needed to be taken because you were influential on other members. But that's the point of a committee to be influential. I mean, that, I'm, that's, just, I, I'm just telling you what the town attorney suggested and they said take another vote just so that it doesn't get challenged. So should Bonnie not have said that she knows the people who wrote the letters and that they wouldn't, I mean, that's completely hearsay. They I wouldn't, wouldn't have said anything if somebody wasn't challenging that it, it sounded like they weren't being honest letters. Right. I don't see how that's a conflict at all. She was responding to another commission member's comments. I wouldn't have I don't said know a thing if they were just read. Nobody said anything. But but that that's e that's equal to like what my behavior was in the meeting in the meeting relative to me trying to say it wasn't done properly. No, like, so I would say attorneys, that. I think the town attorney should probably review this meeting then. The town attorney believed that you were influencing other members. I don't know how Bonnie saying, I know these people influenced other members. And the own person who was challenging it wasn't a voting member. So I don't really think that it's a conflict of interest or an issue at all. Well, then I would ask that the attorney review this meeting as well. I, I don't. Yeah. I was going to say the one with you, Eric, came down to the pictures that were submitted that you sent to the, all the members and then the discussion that was held on that. It, which is which an illegal, illegal making meeting. Making it an illegal meeting. That was the issue with that. But that's not what was said in the letter to you from the, from the, from the attorney. That was after reviewing all the material. We went over all that with him and that's when he made that determination. I think there's equally as much of a conflict of interest than in, in her hearsay testimony than there is in what I did during she that. She wasn't testifying. She was acting as a commission member. It, it, again, it's hearsay, though. Listen it's, to these people. They're, they, you know, everything they know we all. do in these meetings is hearsay almost. We provide our opinions and what we hear from the community. There's no way that what she did tonight was even close to a conflict of interest. There was a comment I mean, made that you some of my neighbors' that. letters were put under due stress to write it. And I know those people. And even if somebody tried to have them do that, they wouldn't have done it. <laughs> All the time, Eric, you say, I know that person and you know they would do X. And you know a lot of people. So that makes sense. And that's exactly what she was doing. This. It's not a conflict of interest. Then can we take a vote on the, the brew pub and get that past us? Um, I don't I, know. I missed the, the legal meet thing about with you. I don't recall that. Maybe I missed that meeting. I don't even know what you're talking about. So I mean I know we yeah, I know about the pictures and all our issue with it. I don't know what you're referring to, Eric. So after it's a little disjointed because people were here, people weren't here. Um, after the brew pub meeting, when we just when we asked zoning, uh, not zoning Tom to send notice that they um, were complying. Correct. Right. Uh, the town attorney reviewed the meeting and believed that when we voted to have Tom um, move forward with the next step, that the offline meeting was influential. And if we got FOIA'd, it would be an issue. Um, so the suggestion was to do another vote with Eric abstaining from the vote. And stating that you know he didn't influence any of our opinions in regard to the brewery, I unfortunately can't remember. I'm gonna have I can try to pull it up now what the actual vote was, and if I can find it, then I, unless Peter tells me otherwise, I don't see why we can't do it now. I believe all were in favor of it anyway, so it might be just a moot point to begin with, but. Right. I agree, but in the effort of following the advice that we were given, um,
Well, I mean, are we going to enforce it or not? If we're not going to enforce it, then what's even the point of voting? Well, they weren't moving to enforce it because they were, well, they're enforcing some things. Um, one of the issues is the, the fence. You know, they didn't really think that we had a great leg to stand on the fence. Um, which brings up another point, which is that their submittals tonight, while detailed in some aspects, were completely not detailed in others. But I don't know. I don't want to go on a tangent, but I, th I think your vote tonight is going to send this whole thing down a different avenue. One you don't want to be down, but so be it. I just go back to Okay, my point due to there. this, I'm sorry, go ahead, Don. Uh, well, I guess I guess the discussion is over, but uh, it seems like if you're going to grant a demolition permit, you, you ought to have evidence that the property needs to be demolished. But that's just my opinion. I mean, when we demolished in the past, as I recall, I mean, we've had letters from structural engineers going into, you know, what the foundation was like and all that kind of jazz. It wasn't just, you know, the aesthetics of a porch or a railing. Well, the, well, the, the whole well, they reason no they have to demo this house isn't all because of the structural. It's because they have to raise it up over a foot. So but, before but we go off on a tip, let's then a standalone house that's not in a flood zone. But every house on Gravel Street would have to be demolished if they were to do more than half the value of the work. And Pearl Street. And Pearl Street and so, Water Street and West Mystic. Well, well, some of those oh, houses are already above that level. No. Can we get back to the brewery so I can read you what the voters. Sure. Due to this, we believe the enforcement action may be viewed by the court to be contaminated. Uh, for, uh, we recommend the HDC reconsider its decision with the member properly recusing itself right from discussion and voting on with the remaining members stating on the record their decision is not affected by their accused members' viewpoints and standpoints. So this was when we took a vote to move forward with enforcement actions with regard to the two alleged violations, one signage, one exterior fence. So we would have to re-vote on those. Okay, so if everyone is in agreement with that, we can do that now. Well, only people who are here for that hearing can vote, correct? Because I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Um, you bring a really good valid point, Don. Um, who voted? Didn't I'm you just read that, that, Sarah? That, that only the people who were Sarah did. Yeah, because they would be the only ones who would know what it was. All right, so this was, I just have to jump back to the meeting. Bear with me one more second. I don't remember the detailed specifics, but when we got, when, whenever those things were shared, it didn't influence me. I mean, I voted, I felt the same way. I think I found it. Maybe. Did it, did you bring up something we weren't, did, we didn't know? I can't remember. I sent a picture of the front of the building from across the street. And we're not supposed to correspond outside of I know that. a meeting. And that's what was happening. Um, well, you, you can correspond. It's just that the information becomes subject to the Freedom of Information Act. 
and it has to be recorded. It's not that you can't, you can't, you can't talk. I did, everyone's confusion over or understanding of what the FOIA laws are, I, I think is not accurate. Well, I don't. There's not a criminal sanction for having a meeting. There's just. Well, it is if you're on. When I was on town council, it it, it is. You're not allowed to. It's a meeting within a meeting. It's not coming up. So I I guess what I can promise you is next time I'll have it all prepared. Know who are the voting members. I'll let you all know in advance, and then we can do a vote rather than continue this because yes. it's late. Oh, we just I, put I, it under if we put under old business and we'll actually put it written into the okay. minute. So you guys will have, yeah, you'll have it there for that. Okay. Eric, the reason that you're not allowed to do it is because it, these are supposed to be public meetings and the public, anybody who wants to be on should be part or be able to hear what we're saying to each other. And we'll, when we email each other separately, that's not possible. That's why they have that. Right, but the emails that went back and forth relating to that could have easily just been added to the record. It's there's no way to jump into that like a conversation. That that's my point is that the the data, the email would have just been subject to the Freedom of Information Act, which would have required it to been added. So it could have just been avoided if those emails were just added to the record. I'm not sure about that, but that's clearly not the intent of public meetings. You're not supposed to add, you know, email data to a meeting later. That's not how it's supposed to be handled. I think we go back to the suggestion where, you know, we were looking at April, May having a meeting prior to one of our meetings. So um, we can go over some housekeeping items and bring in even the town attorney for discussion, kind of refreshing because we've got a lot of new members to kind of go through procedural stuff. So it might not be a bad idea to have something like that. Just have a, you know, special meeting for that. That would be good. Thank you, Peter. All right, new business. Do we want to do election of officers or do we want to wait? If we're going to have a meeting before a meeting. Why don't we do it then? Then you'd have to notice it for free. <laughs> right. I don't care. Well, this is the first time we've had everyone, isn't it? We're missing Max. No, we're missing oh, Max. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. You're right. I, 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 don't know. I say go ahead and vote. I'm my vote is to vote today. A man of action. Yeah. I I don't know. I think Max is a voting member. He's, he's not a voting member though, is he? Yes, he is. Do alternate, I don't think alternates vote for-, for Is Max an alternate? I thought he was a regular member. No, Max no he's not. Oh, oh, I, okay. I'm misunderstood. I thought he was a full member. So um, I'm yeah. presently the chair. I don't, Eric, are you the vice chair? Yeah. And Todd, you're the secretary? Yes. Okay. So those are our, those are our officers now. Well, I would make a motion that we keep the same officers in their same position. I'll second that. Okay. Any objections or comments? Does anyone want to speak for Todd Brady? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just trying to add a little levity. You if did. You don't, you did a good job. <laughs> if I don't, then, I'll do yeah. a roll call. Uh, if no, nobody else wants to read the call of the meeting, be my guest. <laughs> right. But you no. got to read it as fast as I read it because it's pretty boring. I'm going to abstain. Uh, Moriarty, aye. Brady? Aye. Goodman? Aye. Levinson? Aye. All right, we have uh, officers. Linda, this is the earliest we've ever done it. You should be pleased with us. Um, I, think, I think Linda fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other new business? I just want to... Um, yes. Would you guys want me to set up, try and set up that workshop for the 19th I would really appreciate or the 3rd? So the, the 19th third of April, April or the third of May? I was thinking April 19th or Mar May 3rd. Um, hold on. What, are, what is the workshop? To I, have I would, 
to get the town attorney to come in and kind of go over procedural. Oh. April 19th would be better for me, but I can make either work. Okay. How about everyone else? What was the other date? May 3rd. Um, Definitely the 19th is better for me. I'm out of town on the day. Peter, Peter, this would be before the meeting? Correct. Okay. Honestly, both days are just as bad. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't matter. Okay. And probably we want to give an hour, so it would be starting at six. Sooner the better. Okay. So tentatively, I'll, I'll look into trying to arrange that with the town attorney. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right. If I haven't just, I have. Oh, I'm sorry, Bonnie. Go ahead. I just, I don't want to go into a whole discussion or d discuss it now, but maybe we can talk about it at a future meeting. Because some of these issues that came up, and like even this issue on the gravel street tonight, has there ever been any discussion about notifying neighbors of these pending projects? I mean, they. I, I brought it up on at least a couple occasions. I mean, it, I think that it should be done. I, I just got a letter from my house in Long Island from. It, it's more, it's not a historic district, so it wasn't about that, but that the, the trustees are meeting and, you know, they gave me notice so that if I wanted to come do any public comment, they gave me the date and time of the meeting. And I think it's really, I know it'd be expensive, but at least for the next, the neighboring properties, I think it would solve some of our complaints require the applicant to notify the neighbors that you have to do for a demo permit i have to send a certified letter to every abutting property owner require the applicant to do it and pay for it well either way somehow notice maybe should be given to, to people and i think that that's a great question for the town attorney yeah. um i mean i know that p and z has to notify the abutting property owners and then there's notice in the paper um you know not i have some clients that read the paper and tell me what's being noticed and others don't and they don't know what's happening right. um i i don't know the answer to that but i think it's a really good question to ask ask the town attorney i mean transparency is better than not having it and yeah. I think you just have to be aware of the burden you can impose on all these poor people who are just coming in for a storage shed in their backyard. Um, well, maybe there's a level of, you know, if it's a big house project like this on, you know, I don't know. Maybe there could be. A, well, I, I should have left the value on the application and make it a value amount. If the work's over $10,000, which is going to be obvious what it is. Then, then you should notify. But if it's well, um, I, I think if it's a fence that's on the property line, you should notify the other property owner. If it's yeah, yeah that's 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 fair. So that's if, not can, well, I pose this question to you: We're the historic district commission. You know, in any other zone, you know, I, you know, you don't have to tell the abutting property owner that you're building a fence. It's it's aesthetics. Um, so, you know, if, if you lived in Stonington and you complied with the zoning regs and put up a fence, you don't have to tell the abutting property owner that you're doing it. So we are the gatekeepers of those aesthetics. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I just would, would encourage you to think twice before you overly bureaucratize the process. Yeah. I mean, I understand the reason why you want to let people know. And I think that the situation appears to be one that you know maybe maybe we weren't things weren't fully disclosed to us or maybe we didn't look closely enough or maybe we did and they didn't do what they were supposed to do and it's clearly an unfortunate occurrence but i don't know if you if you get involved in having people notice everything that they do as sarah, as sarah said i can build a fence on my property and not talk to my neighbor about it maybe that's why i'm building the fence but you live in a restricted community it's like an hoa HOA can impose rules. You got to notify the neighbor if you're going to put up a flagpole. 
Yeah, I know, but I'm just not in favor of those kinds of things. I think it's a it's a overreach, but that's my personal opinion. Can, can, you look can at this I thing? say I, something? I, yeah. Can you hear me? Um, so I'm not sleeping. Um, my computer's not working, so I'm taking <laughs> minutes long hand tonight. So lots of fun here in my house. Um, so a couple of things. When I first started here, and th things have changed because you know everybody's online, and you know we're finding out information in so many different ways. But every Monday, folks in Mystic, especially the historic district, were looking at the legal ads to see what was happening in Mystic. And that was pretty much, you know, boy, they were looking and they were calling what's going on. I want to know more about this. So I don't think that that's happening so much anymore. Maybe there's another way to, you know, to find, you know, to kind of put it out there, although we have the web portal. And the other piece of it, I would just be a little concerned about, and this is just coming from my perspective, is the manpower that we have to be able to, to do that for every application, because I really think if you're gonna do it for one, you have to do them, yeah. do it for them all and you have to do it right. And you can't do it wrong or forget someone. So that's a bit of a concern that I have. Although I think it's laudable to let people know. I think it's important, especially if they're not here year round, they're not always reading the day, maybe they're reading a different paper. Um, but I, that would be my concern as far as that. So, well, I like the Eric idea that uh, make the applicant pay for it. Yeah, it's, I, it's, I, and it's not about paying for it. It's about providing the buffer list for them. And what is that buffer list? Yeah, yeah. Is it just a butters? Is it 150 feet? So there's a lot of, lot of, lot of things to, to get in place before well, you so go. So when forward. we put the notice in the paper, mm -hmm. is that list? In the in the attached file, uploaded ahead of time on the website before the meeting. Good point. It is not upload. It is uploaded ahead of time before the meeting. It is not uploaded in the same um, uh, number of days that is required for the legal notice. So the legal notice is required no more than fifteen, no less than five days. I, the legal ad is uploaded to the web portal with the application package, maybe not quite five days. It depends on when we get it up there. So if so it is ahead of time. Info on the website, that would be notice that people could go mm -hmm. and look. I mean, yeah. I, ju I just think though it's about reasonableness, which is, you know, the, a lot of people have moved into this and made a choice to buy in the historic district commission, knowing that their neighbors' properties and such are going to be protected, just like the woman tonight with the fence. I'm sorry, I don't remember her name, but you know, and I live around the corner from that house. And had she have been informed that, I think she probably would have appeared. Like I, I'm still irate about the gravel street thing. I don't know why so much, but the reality is, is you had the, the architects pick and choose their former clients to write letters in support of a project that There's some of them probably didn't even know anything about. Anybody supports any project, you can say they pick and choose. I mean, that's just- I didn't. Perfect. I didn't ask for one letter in support. I didn't get one letter against. Well, so, and if someone wants to, fine. If they don't, fine. And if someone doesn't pay attention to the public notices and stuff, and they don't find about, out about something, then, then shame on you. But the fact of the matter is nobody reads the, the day anyway, except they're older people, certainly not younger people. So the notice probably isn't worth the paper it's written on in most cases. But I don't think, I'm just really opposed to going out there and babysitting everyone, you yeah. know, for every single, single little thing that happens. I mean, it's just, it's just- not For every little thing that I taught, I, 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 for the vent sticking out of the top of your building for whatever, I don't even think you should have been here. That, that was a waste of time. Um, you know, for a condenser sitting on the side of the house somewhere tucked in the back, you don't see it. Again, a waste of time. Tearing a house down, building a new house, putting a big addition on. I don't know. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I just, you know, the Historic District Commission is, is operated for 40 years. I didn't mean to open up a can of worms. Yeah. Oh, you did, Bonnie. You did. Well, I think it's something we can talk to the attorney about. I don't want to get into the weeds, but I just had a quick question is the online posting visible? Because not everything that's like, it, 
is it's not a newspaper when you go online it's it's a series of articles does everyone understand my question if you if mean, I only get the to go into the announcements and then click on the announcements and then find it, it the on okay. on the day online it's it's just as hard as finding in the paper you're not gonna oh, okay it. okay i just didn't know if it was like so far buried but i don't again i don't want to yeah. Along I mean, I read the I read the day online every day just to see what's going on, but you'll never get to that unless you're actively searching for it. Okay. And, and, and even then, it's still hard to find. But just understand that you know when you have to file these public notices or these you know, notices to your neighbors and everything. I mean, you know, you, you you've got to document who you sent them out to. You've got to have your po you got to come in with your receipt from the post office and everything. You got to produce it, and in this case, they give it to the planning design. Yeah, department. it'd be a pain. You want people to have to go through that because no. you know what's going to happen? No. They're not going to. They no. can't. They don't even read the damn thing that Linda gives them that shows them what they're supposed to bring to the meeting. Yeah, so I know. Okay. You're setting everybody up for failure. Is the problem? I agree. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not diminishing the importance of people knowing what's going on next door to them, but. I think some of it, you know, some of it's just got to come down to personal responsibility or, or whatever. And you can't, because you, you're not going to be able to hand feed them giving out notices anyway. It's just going to blow up in your face. Every meeting we have, every person who comes in is not going to have complied if, in fact, you make them comply. So why not put something in the requirements that said they have to notify their neighbors, but make it vague enough that if they don't do it, they don't do it. Some way to, like, encourage them to do it. Well... Yeah, but then, but then it's toothless, Eric. Yeah, I, I go back to just uh, my thing would be just the fence on the property line. If you're going to put a fence on your property line, let the next door neighbor know about it before you come before us. All right, let's save this for the workshop. Okay. Well, then you're going to schedule the workshop at three o'clock in the afternoon to start. Fair point. I love things. Um. All right, does anyone have anything else that they want to add this evening? I hope I didn't insult you, Linda, that's all. All right, I move to adjourn. Second. We're adjourned, thank you. It's nice to see you all. Yeah. Hopefully it will be in person next April. time. Yeah, everybody's live in April. <laughs> Excellent. So that first meeting, Peter, is in April. We're all at the town annex. April 19. No, 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 first one, the first meeting of the month, April 4th. Or whatever it was. It was April 5th, 5th, when you say April 5th. So the next time we will be in person. Correct. We, we you do have the option for hybrid as far as I know. So if, if for some reason one of the commission members can't make it, they should be able to come 5th. on. April 5th. Yeah, April 5th. Very good. I look forward to seeing you all in person. All right. Very good. All right. Bye. See you guys. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>